What is Christian nationalism? Oh yeah, we're going there today. (laughs) We hear this word being thrown around all the time, but what does it actually mean? I've been curious forever now. It's, I never hear the same definition twice. One columnist wrote that the new Speaker of the House checks all the boxes of what a Christian nationalist is. When asked to clarify, the, this columnist spoke about his views on abortion and his views on marriage. And if that's the definition, one doesn't have to be a Christian to be a Christian nationalist. How funny is that? There's got to be something wrong with your definition. And frankly, that just means you're a Republican. <laughs> but, but, he, but, but it goes on. Another reporter, this time from uh, N- MSNBC, once said that uh, Christian nationalists are those who believe our rights as Americans don't come from an earthly authority, Supreme Court or Congress, but they come from God. Which is particularly hilarious because that's literally what the Declaration of Independence says. Which was written by Thomas Jefferson, one of the few, the minority non-Christian founding fathers of our country. (laughs) So if he is a Christian nationalist, Thomas Jefferson, I don't know who isn't. Because he said, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Are you kidding me? So that can't be a working definition. Others have attempted to define Christian nationalism straight from the dictionary, saying that nationalism specifically is loyalty or devotion to your nation. One dictionary actually adds, exalting one nation above all others and placing a primary emphasis on promotion of its culture and its interest as opposed to the nation to the to those of other nations which basically just means putting the needs of your own people first before ministering to other countries which is literally why countries exist <laughs> so that pe- elected officials would be accountable to the people immediately above them that's what local government is for, to be accountable to the people. So that's, you know, that's not a bad thing. Uh, In fact, what's interesting is that one prominent evangelical leader whom I very much respect calls himself a Christian nationalist solely because of what the dictionary says. Because he's a Christian and he believes local government has a primary responsibility to its own people first. Whether or not you agree with that or not, that's a pretty simple and straightforward definition. So, before we go any further, uh, to make this absolutely simple for us, anytime somebody asks you, are you one of those Christian nationalists? You absolutely must respond by asking, now, what do you mean? by Christian nationalist. Put it on them to define it. Because there's so many different definitions out there, and I can go, I can keep you guys perhaps entertained all morning with some of the more interesting definitions I've heard. But ask them, what do you mean? Because I've had conversations where people have given me their definition, and I've said, hey, look, I'm not ignorant of politics, and I'm certainly well aware of religion. I am unaware of a single person who believes, professes, or even, I I haven't even heard of somebody who believes what you just said Christian nationalism is. Very important to define it. But but let's not be naive either. The reason why most people don't have a well-thought-out working definition of what Christian nationalism is, is because slurs don't have definitions. Slurs don't have definitions. You can usually tell what a word means by who is using it. And that word didn't originate in our popular culture with our more patriotic brothers and sisters in Christ. It came from those who wanted to shame those who are more patriotic in their beliefs. It's meant to be a not-so-subtle insult or slur attempting to shame our more patriotic Christian brothers and sisters. 
And with that in mind, you, you notice you can't define necessarily what any slur means. I'm not going to say any out loud, but if you think of any, they don't have definitions. They're just blanket terms to paint someone, someone else in a disgusting light just because of who they are or what they believe. That's not okay. And so it's kind of shameful that it's gotten such open acceptance the way that it has. However, are more th- those of us who are more patriotic in our Christianity and in our beliefs as Americans here, you know, sometimes we go too far too. And, I, and when I say this, I mean this. I've attended services, particularly on the 4th of July weekend, in other churches, where if a blind man were to walk off of the street into your worship service, he wouldn't know if he is at a worship service or at the parade taking place afterwards. We're playing all the same songs, the Star Spangled Banner, My Country, Tis a V, things like that. A speaker coming up and talking mostly about the Founding Fathers. That's a swing in the wrong direction too, I think. You know, there's a time and a place for that. It's just not at the Sunday worship service because it can confuse who or what is actually being worshipped, God or country. You know, and that being said, we have those patriotic hymns in the back of our hymnal. And I'm not ashamed of them. I think there's a time and a place for them. Uh, I'm not opposed to having a more patriotic service one of these days um, uh, for a particular event. I'm just saying that um, on Sunday mornings, there has to be a bit of a bifurcation there. So I want to direct the rest of our time together to ask, what is our role as Christians in civil society? What does the Bible say about how we should view our country? I I want the rest of our time really outlining, less time outlining vague terms that are purposely vague, and more time saying, okay, what does biblical patriotism actually look like? And point number one of that is that we are to recognize that we are on foreign territory. All of us. (laughs) Now, when you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, this world is no longer your home. Even as much as we love this country, many of us, it is not our home. We're just passing through this land now. The great uh, Christian novel, Pilgrim's Progress, allegorizes this point in a beautiful way as the main character in the early chapters escapes the city of destruction and spends the rest of the book on this amazing journey on his way to the celestial city that perfectly allegorizes our life as well. As Christians, we have escaped the destruction that is to come. We've escaped judgment and we're on our way to glory, but we're not there yet. We're on our way. And this world is now basically one big camping trip for us. And we need to start thinking about it that way. I mean, think about it. Nobody wastes time decorating their tent when they go camping, do they? Imagine going to a campsite and somebody's hanging a picture on one of the walls and somebody's painting the side of it a different color. That would look ridiculous, wouldn't it? See, a fellow Eagle Scout gets that joke. (laughs) But... uh, no, that would be absurd, obviously, because the point of a tent is you just need something to keep the rain out long enough to get to your actual destination until you get back to your true home. And the same is true of us. Let's not forget, we are only here for a short period of time. Eternity is going to last a lot longer than this short lifetime that we enjoy. And still yet, the history of the United States, should the Lord tarry, you know, Eternity is going to be so much longer than even the history of our nation. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't want to see the tent collapse while I'm in it either. Which brings me to point number two. Seek the long-term good of your culture. This is what biblical patriotism looks like. Seek the long-term good of your culture. Our first reading in Jeremiah 29 is literally describing exactly that. And now Jerusalem's destruction was being prophesied of, and they're going to be in captivity to Babylon for 70 years. That's the context of that verse. 
And what does this verse say to people literally about to go into a foreign land? It says, seek the good of the city and for your own betterment as well. Not not to live defeated, not to live, woe is me, we're stuck here, just doom and gloom. But no, build houses, get married, have children. These are all long-term good things to be doing. And that's our directive as well for this, this voyage we're at right now here in our country. Seek its long-term betterment. Seek the good of it long-term. And it, 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 it's tragic to me, you know, like as you see, you know, <laughs> the housing world, the, fa- the families unit just being so, <sighs> the state of marriage in our country is just sad. And even even to those who are married, you know, I've heard from tons of people on politically on the left and on the right that say, oh, how could I possibly bring children into this world? Things are so bad right now. And, you know, it would be, how could I bring a child into this world? But that's the opposite of what the Bible says we should do. Now, that's not in our long-term benefit as a country or as individuals or as our own families to withhold that gift. I mean, I know what I'm about to say comes from a biased place in my own heart, (laughs) but I think the world needs more kids like mine. (laughs) That, I, I get it. I know that. I'm probably just slightly biased, but I thoroughly believe that. How different would this world be if we were to raise children that have our values? Couldn't you imagine if we took that mentality and embraced that mindset and just maybe we could start to see this crazy world start to turn itself around? And to top it all off, it, 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 that, that verse speaks about seeking the peace and prosperity of the city that you find yourself in. To not seek or hope for its doom or gloom. Don't build yourself a doomsday bunker. (laughs) But seek its betterment. Be part of the solution. You know, there's a reason why they made this church the way that they did. I mean, for sure they could have constructed this church much faster and much cheaper out of cheaper materials. They could have thrown it up real together real quick. Of course, but there's a reason why they used bricks instead of straw, <laughs> instead of something that'll be here today and gone tomorrow. They, the founders of this church wanted there to always be a biblical church here in South Amboy, a place to shine the light of God into this region. And they did that not thinking about themselves. Would have been neat. If they were thinking about themselves, they would have chose cheaper materials. They chose the strong stuff so there would always be a church here thinking of you guys. 160 years ago, they were thinking about you and your children when they built this church. That's a pretty radical idea <laughs> in our modern society that's all about me and let me consume everything and leave nothing for the next person. It's thinking ahead. Nobody plants a tree for themselves. They think of the generation afterwards that will enjoy its shade. How different would our world be if we started thinking like that too? If we started thinking through that lens. And I suppose that brings me to point number three. Pray for the campsite. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. These are all words for prayer, supplication, prayer, intercession, thanksgiving. Pray for our nation. Pray for our people. Pray for, our, it says, our representatives. Or for our kings and those who are in high authorities. And I'll come back to that point in one second, but it doesn't just say, it goes on to say that, you know, 
the reason isn't for them or for their agenda. You don't have to like their particular political agenda. It says, hey, you do this for you so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So yeah, you could pray for their repentance. <laughs> you could pray for things to, um, for them to change their stance on things. There's nothing wrong with that. But now we pray for them that, hey, if they're succeeding in what is right, hey, then we're freed up to live a peaceful and godly life. And we're freed up to be about our father's business. And by the way, when Paul wrote these words, Emperor Nero was in charge. Those of you who know your history, he was the one who brought about a terrible persecution of Christians in the first century. So if Paul is writing that when that guy is in charge, that means even if you don't like the guy in the White House, you can pray for him too. Regardless of whoever wins in November, we can pray for who our leaders are, praying for our Congress, our senators, our governors, because their success means our prosperity. So we ought to seek that and hope for the good. And we ought to pray for them because of the implications of point number four of my outline, obey those in power above you. Yes, you guys heard me correctly. Romans 13 says clearly that to let everyone be subject to governing authorities, knowing that all authority ultimately comes from God. It's, uh, it's surprising to hear me of all people say this, but go government as an institution is actually a gift from God. Because when it's administered the right way, it restrains evil rather than promotes it. It is meant to restrain evil, that passage goes on to say. Because the only thing worse than a corrupt government is no government at all. Some of you guys know I did a missions trip to Haiti shortly after the earthquake many years ago. Um, I wasn't part of the front lines of people who went in there first. I can't take credit for that, but I was in some of the post follow-up. I was there with... Uh, the Haiti Bible Training Center, training pastors down there. And when I was down there for just a short period of time, it was disgusting how corrupt things were. Where shortly after the earthquake, you have politicians in huge mansions, way nicer than anybody's house I know, and people living in destitute poverty just down the road. It was heartbreaking, and man, it changed the way I view the world. But people today in Haiti would give almost anything to return to that system instead of having the gangs take over and rule rampantly in pure anarchy down there. That's not good either. That's far worse. I'm not promoting corrupt government. Don't hear me wrong. We should seek justice. But we recognize, hey, there's a reason why God put, puts these institutions of human government in place. It is for our betterment and for our good. And to utilize this gift, we obey those God has placed over us as a general principle. And we pray for their good, and we don't actively resist their rightful place in society. Now, some people take that too far without realizing God has placed limitations on that. I mean, we see that in Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6, certainly most prominently, where Daniel and his three friends are admonished before God for resisting government when they had a choice of choosing between honoring God and honoring the king. When you have a bifurcated choice like that, you always choose to honor God. Christ is head of the church, not Caesar. And, we have, and so the choice is made up for us when we have to make a choice like that. And now, fortunately, we've been pretty, pretty blessed in this country that we don't frequently have to choose between those. But we do know, and we've thought as an individual church and as the church of the church in America as a whole, we've thought that we've had to think through that much more critically than we've ever had to over the last couple of years. But we know the truth. You must obey God rather than man, and you can't ignore biblical mandates based off of governmental mandates. So, it's not absolute obey government no matter what. <laughs> Don't hear that wrong. Which, moving on to point number five, though, we are called to be salt and light 
in this world. It's right out of Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 5. And what does that mean? Well, to save a whole sermon I did on this a couple of years ago, we preserve the culture. Salt is a preservative. So we preserve the culture as best as we can before and stop it from spoiling. And as light, we cast away darkness and bring the light of God wherever we go. That's what it means in a nutshell to be salt and light in this world. So as much as it is possible, we don't run and hide from the culture. We try to influence the culture. By nature, we try not to hide in our own monasteries and hide in our own, you know, communes or whatever. But no, we influence the culture for Christ. And so those of you who do have, you know, giftings in art, in media, in music, in writing or whatever, use those gifts to the glory of God. Let, because we're called to let our voice be heard and influence others for him. And with that, we can go to, we can go next door and advocate for something. We can say, hey, th- I don't want this in my backyard. We can go to school board meetings and say, I don't want this in my backyard. Simply because it's not what I believe. And I don't have to, and by, by the way, I don't have to apologize for any of my biblical convictions. We, we, we get talked down to in kind of a strange way about this. Our, but our government was designed to be representative. I just want my views represented. It's as simple as that. I don't have to find clever ways to state my political case outside of my biblical convictions, to find a secular argument to argue for some political point that based off of my convictions, my values are good enough simply because they're my values. And me asking a politician to vote based off of my values is literally what we have a country for. We forget that sometimes. I think we need a reminder about that every once in a while. And finally, we must recognize our primary allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom first. Every other identity beyond that is secondary. Is secondary. Our mission as Christians goes far beyond mere national priorities. Although we do work for it, we labor for our nation, but our primary uh, allegiance is to Jesus Christ. (laughs) You know, it is both comforting and a stretch to our imagination to ponder the fact that Jesus did not just die for this campsite we call America but our neighbors as well, even those who we might call our enemies. Jesus died for them too. And you know, through the denomination we are in the process of entering, I've already heard some amazing stories of ordinary people who've left everything here in the States to go bring the gospel to somewhere that hasn't heard it, to go bring the gospel to a place where a service like this is illegal where you could get jailed at best for having a service like this. And people are going there. God bless them for their bravery and their courage to do that. Now, I don't say that because I'm encouraging all of you to do that. Some of us are called to be missionaries right here in South Amboy. Frankly, we need it. (laughs) One of these days, Africa is going to start sending missionaries here the rate we're going. But I say that because not every one of us is called to do that. But the reason they are, they are able to do it is because they know that their primary allegiance is to Christ. That it's his kingdom they are seeking wherever they are. And they're seeing life through a broader scope than many of us see life through. So look, at the end of the day, guys, you know, I've read the end of the book. All these nations, it's not going to last. It's all going to be destroyed someday. It's all going to fall. We have no lasting city, as our second reading said this morning. I mean, think about it. Rome, Babylon, Athens. Who would have imagined those empires falling? 
Nobody alive at the time would have ever dreamed of a day that Rome would fall. And yet here we are. Should the Lord tarry, the same will be said of America someday. We can't sustain this indefinitely unless the Lord comes back. But, and so, look, eventually it will fall, but not if we as the church have something to say about it in our lifetime. If we stand up on our biblical principles and do something about it. (laughs) Because we are called to pray for this nation, to seek its betterment, to seek its welfare, to be salt and light, to preserve it from spoiling as we see the stink of it already starting to settle in and we, and, and preserve what is good and casting out the darkness around us. And so my question to us is, is that what you've been up to? Have you been laboring in these areas? Have you been a biblical patriot, regardless of all the other titles out there? When was the last time you prayed for our elected representatives? Including the ones you didn't like. When was the last time you prayed for the election and not just for the guy you want to be in power? Are you being salt and light in this world, seeking its betterment? Or are you just commenting on it while it starts to go sour? It's very easy to just comment on things and watch it go sour. Plenty of people do it. We're called to do something more. You know, there's an embarrassingly bad example from King Hezekiah, who's written about in the book of Second Kings and Chronicles and Isaiah, who heard of coming judgment being pronounced upon his land. And he said, oh, well, at least there will be peace in my day. That ought never be so for us. We ought to love the next generation, and generations to come more than just to callously say, ah, at least I can still party it up for a few more years. (laughs) Ah, inflation's not that bad yet. Oh, this, we can still afford this. Ah, you know, uh, my retirement's got enough money. No, let's be more than that. We are called to be better than that. Let us seek to be a people who when people find out that we are Christians around us, they'll be glad to discover that they have a Christian neighbor, a Christian co-worker, a Christian classmate, whatever it might be. Because we ought to have a a reputation of us seeking their betterment, of us being good citizens, of us advocating for what is right and good in this world. All while we ourselves know we have no lasting city on this earth. We are seeking the celestial city that is to come, where we will worship our king, our true king, Christ Jesus, for all eternity. Thanks be to God. Amen.